Stan Jibalisco here with uh, part five of the vacuum tube radio frequency power amplifier series. Uh, I would like to just briefly show you a very common configuration for radio frequency power amplifiers. Uh, this uh, is called a parallel connection of vacuum tubes and for simplicity I have shown triodes here oftentimes tetrodes or pentodes are used. I have shown a grounded grid configuration here. Here are the cathodes connected together to form what you might call a single cathode on steroids as it were. And here are the plates connected together to form what might be called a plate on steroids and the grids are connected together right here to form our grounded grid on steroids. Now I had a, a transmitter, uh, a very good old venerable Drake T4X transmitter. You may remember this. It used two tubes in parallel called 6JB6. They weren't triodes, I believe they were pentodes, but as I've said, I just don't want to clutter up the uh, diagram here. Uh, so what we had here was two vacuum tubes, 6JB6, connected in parallel, which provided a uh, total power DC plate power input of 200 watts. That's the DC plate power input. 200 watts input. Back in those days they used to specify the power limits for ham radio transmitters in terms of the plate power input. Now this was PEP, peak envelope power. And on CW they would also run 200 watts assuming a 50 percent duty cycle. These were I believe class A B amplifiers and if you want to learn about amplifier classes I've made some videos on those uh, in this uh, teach yourself EE -E miscellany uh, playlist just go to my uh, YouTube channel and uh, find the teach yourself EE -E miscellany playlist and you'll find those it generally uh, this was a class A B I don't know whether it was AB1 or AB2, but it was a class AB amplifier, meaning that it was linear for variations in the signal envelope, modulation envelope, but not for the waveform itself. But the important thing when you're talking about linearity in a radio frequency power amplifier is linearity for the modulation envelope. It doesn't have to be linear necessarily for the waveform. The efficiency of this thing was also about, I think it was about 60 percent. So if you ran 200 watts input you would get about 120 watts RF power output from the combination of these tubes. That would be 60 watts per tube and so you would be, uh, you would have 80 watts total dissipated power, 40 watts per tube. 80 watts dissipated is 200 minus 120 and 40 watts assuming that it's equally split two ways. Now that's very important when you have any parallel combination of vacuum tubes like this. You need to match those tubes very very carefully not just according to their part number but ideally they should be pre-tested and then shipped as a pair so that they have as nearly identical characteristics as possible. The reason for that is that if one of the tubes is even a little bit different in terms of its transconductance or gain uh, or efficiency, even just a tiny bit, it will begin to hog more and more of the power and there will be then an unbalance in the dissipation and one of these tubes will end up taking the brunt of the dissipation and it will therefore 
cause the tubes not only to become even more mismatched as time goes by, but uh, will shorten the life of the tubes considerably, or at least the one that's taking the brunt of the action here. So, it's very important. Now, I also had a, um, a Drake L4B linear amplifier that I got later down the, uh, down the pike. And that used a pair of vacuum tubes in parallel known as 3-500Z uh, tubes. Three, uh, iMac can't seem to make that go away. I don't get it. Well, they were, they were known as the iMac 3-500Z. Venerable old workhorse of a vacuum tube. But again, they had to be matched very carefully. And these were in a grounded grid configuration. I don't remember if the Drake uh, T4X had the six JB6s in a grounded grid configuration or not. I honestly don't remember. But I know that uh, the 3-500Z is typically operated in a grounded grid fashion. Another tube that was very popular... Uh, for linear amplifiers was the venerable old 813. I seem to like the word venerable a lot. Maybe someday somebody will call me venerable. <laughs> okay. The old 813. They were about like a, a 3-500Z in terms of their power dissipation capability, I believe. But I remember very, very uh, clearly at the radio station of the University of Minnesota, W0YC, in 1974, 75, 76, when I attended that institution, that venerable institution. They had a, an amplifier that they had built with a pair of 813s. And they had what they called graphite plates. The plates were made of graphite instead of just plain old steel or metal or whatever. And those graphite plates were well known for being able to last a lot longer and dissipate more power than the plain metal ones. In fact, sometimes they, they would actually glow a little bit red. Uh, they, the thing was supplied with 3,700 volts. To the plates so it was a high voltage very high voltage uh, uh, system and I remember once I was grabbing a hold of the plate lead of that thing and it was an insulated wire you know that ran into the to the amplifier so I thought I was safe you know I was the wire was well insulated I thought you know I didn't know why I'm gonna get a shock off this well that insulation had a little crack in it. To make a long story short, I have the scar to this day. Stangibalisco, proprietor and operator of amateur radio station W1GV, signing off. Until next time, so long.